Well, we're going to start an important series, and I think we're going to do a lot of this, and it's having you guys, the viewers, listeners, call in so that we can actually answer your questions and discuss them. And, you know, we're going to pick those questions because I want to pick questions and comments that are actually helping the most people within the discussion. And what's great is we have Dylan along. And Dylan, real quick, um, you know, people know what you do with video editing. They yeah. know that we've hunted together a lot. Yeah. They know that we've shot about 700 videos together. Yep. Um, we started working together in the summer of 2016. We're going on, you know, be almost uh, five years now. Yeah. Um, so pretty crazy. Yeah. Uh, tell people a little bit what you've been doing lately and how far you're booked out and Jeff's kind of gotten me into the consulting game. Um, it just kind of took off trial by fire this year. I mean, I've been doing it since actually we found out 2016, yep. uh, summer 2016 was my first client that I went to for on um, Jeff's behalf. And, and that was kind of baptism by fire. Yes. I think that was like four properties. It was an enormous, I think it was like a thousand acre property and it was just, Hey, go, you know, check this kind out. Fact yeah. finding mission. Yep, fact finding. And is that the one I actually went back and we, met with we did you? a second trip. Okay. back up there it was planned ahead of time that we we're going to do it that way yeah. but yeah i mean since then it's been pretty crazy i should write them all down but i would guess i've probably done 25 clients by now and i have um another i think 16 scheduled out uh now through um i'm booking into july at this point so it's actually yeah. pretty crazy how quickly you know we decided hey we're going to do this a little bit more and all of a sudden emails started flowing in and it's like man i'm booked booked and it's, yeah, like, it's a lot of fun like, so really busy book yeah like, really busy uh, like double booked overbooked yeah dylan's been overwhelmed <laughs> by you guys out there uh thankful i mean that's been yeah, pretty cool it's too awesome. because and i love chatting with you guys about this kind of stuff because i'm passionate about it as well and i love getting fired up about white tails too so in in your head uh ross fernandez uh, michigan now he owns a bunch of culvers he's really busy <laughs> he's he's really you know american success story over the last couple of years it's been incredible um, yeah, I trusted him going to client properties, um, but Dylan's hunted with me, playing tree stand locations, almost every tree stand location in Minnesota, Wisconsin, Dylan had input on, um, even to the point where we argue a little bit. <laughs> I, I think I win most of the time. Yeah, usually when I go back, the stands I, in the tree, Jeff wanted it in. <laughs> well, d like deer names, buck names, okay. you, you, and, you and Diane went up down those. But <laughs> yeah. um, the cool thing is, is Dylan's really the only person that I trust for this all-inclusive everything that we do. Um, you know, I talk about maybe one of my kids someday, but we're talking years away because normally you wouldn't have the opportunity to spend this much time. And I'm not saying that not, I know everything um, 100%. We're, we're learning every day. And that's what's cool is Dylan going to properties is he learns on every property. And a lot of the properties he's going to now, he almost sell himself short because let's say he's been to 25 clients, but quite a few of those have been three day clients and those going forward our three-day client with flying so dylan's for the most part taking over uh flying clients and so he's spending large amounts of time with these clients and so it's more days i think you should look at that you yeah know, that's true than, yeah. Uh, but yep. uh bottom line is um dylan unfortunately knows more <laughs> what we do here yeah. so i guess it's one-sided but he's someone i really trust and he knows the whs way and can apply it to lands and so when we have these calls i thought it was very important that uh dylan be a part of the discussion because sure. he often thinks of things that i'm too spaced out or <laughs> busy with to to think about at the moment there's so much a lot of this stuff is very complex so yep. i think what we'll do is uh john comp from northwoods whitetail seeds is going to call in today and with him you know we have some other more random viewers uh followers but john is one of those experts that you want to interview and we want to talk about seed labels now john and i talk about this stuff all the time but we get a lot of questions about this and these seed labels are real real important this isn't like a scientific approach this is bad seed labels and bad seed mixes to avoid and we have some labels that we're looking at right here there's three of them so john's going to call in and we're specifically going to discuss these and these are things that we're hoping to help you and help you avoid these aren't you know, we're not getting into the percentages and as far as what this means or that means and uh, the scientific blend, we're throwing the science away. This, I think this a lot is, of it's common sense and saving you guys time, money, and frustration. Exactly. And that's where, you know, and I know Dylan has uh, recognized this too, but when you're in front of a client in person, you're making recommendations, um, 
just because we're sponsored or partnered with a product isn't a reason to make that recommendation. And that's why, unless we believe in the product, we are not going to recommend it. And we have to look these people in the face, let alone you guys out there. If we're making recommendations, we have to hear feedback about it. We're not going to recommend junk. We typically wouldn't recommend it unless we choose to use it before we even have a relationship with that manufacturer. So let's have John call in and uh, we'll see uh, um, how this discussion goes. And I think we're gonna, you're going to enjoy this one, especially as it relates to these labels and what to avoid. So we're very fortunate we have John Comp on the line. And uh, if you could say hello, John. Hi, guys. <laughs> and uh, what's nice about this is John has a lot of integrity when it comes to his food plot seed blends and switchgrass and screening. And we're going to talk a little bit about that because you'll find in the seed industry there's not a lot of integrity. There's a lot of waste. There's a lot of bad combinations. We're going to hit a few of those labels today, and we'll show you John's label too. But uh, we have some labels right here. There's three of them, and we'll refer to John's a little bit too here. And um, and so let's just kind of dive right in. This first one, uh, I'm looking at, and, and John and I discuss these all the time. And John, you sent this to me a while back, and then Brandon with First uh, Choice Food Plots, we were kind of having a discussion. And this one's 72% uh, germination rate, but you know that doesn't seem that bad to me anyways. Right. It doesn't seem that bad, but what what caught my eye was the, the long list of the noxious weeds on the bottom of the tag. And, you know, we, we talked multiple times, Jeff, how we, we, we just did this two weeks ago, we rejected another load of switchgrass because when you're looking for switchgrass, you're looking for, you need something right away to work. You don't want to be battling with weeds because the weeds is an absolute killer of a good switchgrass stand so right off the bat i don't want anything in there or as little as possible i you know nothing's perfect but as little po as possible in the form of a weed or uh you know it's also listed as other crop really? so that's that's one thing that kind of caught my eye so you know I, I would i would rather pay a little bit more money even if we weren't selling the seed for something that's clean uh and it's going to germ well than pay half the price and be battling weeds for two or three years. Well, and it, you know, one of the things I I purchased some uh, cheap switchgrass seed. It was before you were offering, and it was probably seven eight years ago. Uh -huh. And um, and and then I ended up with foxtail on two properties that I have in Wisconsin. And to me, there was not foxtail in those areas uh, previously. So. Um, you know, that's kind of a scary thing. And if you look at some of those percentages can be very small, but a little bit of weed seed goes a long ways. Right. And if you look on this label, I see foxtail, plantain, and ragweed. Mm -hmm. So and, uh, kind of scary. Now, if I'm not mistaken, you were, you were spraying two or three times and then drilling that seed in, correct? Or frost seeding? Um, that was a combination of both back then. Right. So you, it's not like you were tilling the ground to where you were possibly introducing foxtail. Oh, okay. So no. if you think about that, that there's only one source of where that fox tail came from. Oh yeah, okay. and and so, when you kind yeah. of spread that around the property and you don't see it anywhere else, yeah, <laughs> then then uh, then yeah. you see that in that location. So mm -hmm. uh, folks really pay attention to those weeds uh, weeds at the bottom and really yeah. when it comes to switchgrass. So John, how many times do you put weeds? Do you have to show weeds in your label? Because you, if it's there, you have to show it. So how many times yeah, do you show weeds in your labels? By Michigan law, and that's where we're based out of, so that's we have to follow Michigan law, which is pretty strict. Okay, we have to show anything. You basically, what's in the bag, whatever's in the bag, needs to be on the tape. So I'm looking yeah. at ours right now. There's noxious weeds, none, none listed. And that's, okay. and that's what you and, always want to see. <laughs> yeah, 0% weed, uh, purity is 98.9%. Uh, and then the other one point, whatever percent, and now this is switchgrass we're talking about. Right? Yes, yeah. So, so the other thing, and this is the best way I can describe it, the, the other, inert, the quote unquote inert matter on this is that shell that, I call it a shell, you know, because if you say coating, well then all of a sudden everyone's jump. oh my god, you got coated seed, no that's not what it is. The way I describe it to customers is that the coating on a switchgrass seed is kind of like a peanut shell or a walnut shell or sure uh, uh, coating on an M&M. &M. So yeah. that, and it's just, it's for simplicity's sake, Jeff. 
but that's what that inert matter is in our mix. I, you know, I can't speak for anybody else that sells switchgrass because I, I have no clue what they, what they do. That's right. just a weak there. But that's the way. That's the best way I can describe it. Now, some of that needs to be broken down with the stratification process, and some of it is ready to go. Yeah, and we'll talk about that on the next, mm -hmm. the next label too, right there. Sure. Um, and. Uh, yeah, I was just thinking about M and M's. I'm kind of hungry. <laughs> I like eating the shell, so that's the shell's a good thing in an M and M. You know, yeah. But uh, but, um, but let's uh, and again, I encourage people. And something you got to know about John. Tell people it kind of goes by what you just said. Your bags of seed are all clear. You know, yeah. if you notice a lot of seed bags in the industry, they're not clear. And the reason is because there's a lot of garbage, and we're going to hit the last. Wait till you see the last label we have, guys, um, and, and the percentage that is not seed in there, it's going to blow you away, and it's from a well-known, we're not going to talk about any of the companies that do this. There's so many to choose from with bad seed labels, but uh, you'll be blown away with the garbage that's in there. And, and John, we appreciate that you have clear bags because when Dylan and I are making uh, recommendations to clients for seed to use, we can look them squarely in the eyes and say, hey, just check the bag. <laughs> look I think the, bag. Well, the reoccurring yeah. theme here is rather than going for the cheaper option and thinking, okay, this, this is going to get me by, look at the headaches that it's going to cause you down the road and say, okay, I should have just spent the money to begin with a yeah. few extra dollars a, a pound or whatever it is. Yeah. yeah. Amen to that. Yeah. 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 Well, the one, and I, Jeff, I think I don't, it was on your YouTube the other day. People were talking about, or you had, a, you were talking about the, the, the screen, the cover and stuff. And somebody had yeah. said, why is switchgrass so expensive? Okay, and this is a disclaimer. Yeah, we don't just uh, the the switchgrass. We don't. It's not marked up very high with us. Okay, it's very expensive to bring it in in the first place. Okay, and I cannot touch a seven dollar bag of switchgrass. I just can't. Nor will I, because I know what it takes to get a seven dollar bag of switchgrass. I have a really good idea. <laughs> a lot <Okay>. of garbage. <laughs> well, I, I, I'm not. What somebody does, and and, and you know. There's, I've got email after email after text message after Facebook message of this is what we bought and this is what we're seeing. And I'm like, okay, you're yeah. the 19th person that, that has sent me this problem from this cheap switchgrass company or companies. And I just, I won't go down that road because I, I just don't want to. To me, I, and this, you guys hit on it just a minute ago. You guys got to be able to look your clients in the eye and say, look, if you go buy John Switchgrass, it should be, you know, this is the purity. They, they sell good stuff. And we've built a reputation for having as good a seed as anybody. And I want, trust me, I could go get a truckload of $7 switchgrass right now and have it here in two days. Okay? Yeah. I won't touch it. I just won't. That's just not, that's not what we do. Yeah. And that's, uh, and that's really comforting for us to know. Again, we have to look these people in the eye. And I know even last year, I remember talking to you in the spring. So many people want switchgrass. It's more and more every year. Uh, we're finding more ways to use it better and uh, for not only deer, but the combination with small game too. Yeah. Um, but uh, what's really important is that, uh, again, you turn, people don't realize you have people ready to buy this stuff and you're turning away an order and a shipment that comes to you that you have buyers lined up for that want the stuff that you can actually make money on and, and you turn it away and tell them to tell them to get you another bag because it's full of garbage. And so... We appreciate that about you and why, and it's why you're on the call. And it kind of brings us to the next label. Yep. Um, this one talks about uh, a germination rate of 41%. It mm -hmm. talks about dormant seed of 54%. Now this one happens to have uh, no weed seeds in, but you know, I know with you, you're, you have a recent bag, I think it's 62, 63% germination rate, and then you have about 28% hard. Can you explain that to people what the, all that means and why? This bag right here would would not be a wise investment for their money, no matter what they pay for it. Um. Okay. So, if, so we're looking at my take versus versus this take. Okay. Now they've got a germination rate of forty one percent. So what that means is, and I've never done it this way, but you you planted switchgrass this way last year, uh, where you sprayed. I, I believe it was three times, and then you. Uh, broadcast right before rain. I believe it was June sometime, Jeff. It was okay. In, in fact, the soil was uh, already wet from recent rains. Yep. I smashed it all down into the the soil with the Packer Max and the Kubota tires, 
and then it, I sprayed that same day and it was it was early to mid June and then we had a lot of rain in the forecast right. and, and right. I overseeded quite a bit and I couldn't believe the amount of growth I had. That was close to four feet tall last year, just right. from early to mid June and on. Now, what would happen is that if you were to use this seed according to this tape, only forty-one percent. Oh, I'm sorry, only forty-one percent of that seed would have germinated, meaning right away. Okay, because you got those soil temperatures there, the moisture's there, and just like say, if you were to put a food plot in, it's going to grow right away. And there's a misconception of switchgrass that it needs to be strati stratified, meaning it needs to go through cycles of freezing, thawing, with moisture included. You just can't throw switchgrass in your freezer, you pull it out, put it back in the freezer, pull it out. You're not introducing moisture to it, so it's not really getting stratified. Now, if you look at this, if you look at the label, it says 41% germination. That being said, only 41% of that seed's gonna germinate. Now, what you used with ours last year, I believe, was a 60 to 62% germ with a 28 to 29 percent hard seed or dormant seed so let's say you did an acre and you put out 10 pounds that means 6.3 pounds of that switchgrass give or take a half a pound germinated which is a lot of switchgrass okay yeah and, and i rest and i doubled the rate <laughs> okay. you would have so, been, you would have you would have got mad at me pounds. for wasting seed probably but <laughs> right. i uh, i wanted but, to come so in right so <laughs> with with the 63 to 64 percent germination rate of the switchgrass. Now that's not the overall, that's not a five pound bag, only 63 percent is going to germinate. Eventually 90 to 95 percent of it's going to germinate, but the other 27 percent is going to germinate probably towards the later half of the summer, or if not into the next year where it does take some stratification to break that coating down. Right. Okay. So that's what that needs of switchgrass. And that's a great thing about switchgrass is it is extremely hardy. As long as, you know, you mentioned it when we first started talking, as long as you eliminate weed competition, that's the death of all switchgrasses, shade and competition. And right. I've, even, I've even seen it where it's taller grasses or taller switchgrass shades out shorter switchgrass and it kills switchgrass. And so a field that had big blue stem, little uh, blue stem, Indian grass, switchgrass in it, Three years later, you can hardly find a stunted piece of switchgrass in there because it's all been shaded out. Yeah, I think once it gets rolling and it's like a 90 to 95 percent pure switchgrass, I think you're in really good shape. But it's that first year, and now this will be the fifth year we've planted switchgrass, and it's been a learning process every year. The first year, I knocked it out of the park. I frosted and I had five foot tall switchgrass at the end of the year, and I'm going, oh. it's a piece of cake. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Reality I remember it. that. <laughs> yeah, the reality set in. But but anyway, uh, so that, that's the one thing when you're looking at switchgrass. Uh, those are the, the, the three important numbers as far as the, the, the germination is. The total germ, uh, our bag says 90%. And, and I was telling you before uh, we, we, we went on here, Jeff, is that when we we have our labels made, our, our we always label the low side. So let's say our switchgrass germs in the 90 to 95 percent range i put 90 percent on the label just you know so you're you're you kind of stay you're staying safe but anyway so then the next one you're looking at is that the um the hard seed the, the dormant seed that's the stuff that may take some stratification to get it to pop and then the germination is uh that that percentage that's what likely would be able to pop if you planted it this spring in a clean uh, a clean environment Right. Yeah. And that, in a lot of people, I, you know, there's people that plan ahead and they're frost seeding, you know, that's one thing, but boy, so many people do not plan ahead. And, you know, even clients that I go to, they, they watch the videos on switchgrass and planning mm -hmm. ahead and frost seeding. And, and you've probably, I mean, Dylan, you've seen this too, where they're planting a lot of switchgrass this year, but it's over a lot of weeds and garbage. And right. It, it hasn't yeah. been pre- So they can get it in like I did last year. I sprayed, right. mm -hmm. I put it on the ground in, in June. That worked out, but if I would have had a low germ rate seed and I and I uh, seeded to specifications, we advise it eight to ten pounds per acre, then I could have had a very low percentage stand of switchgrass that had weeds fighting within there too. And so when I went into year two, I could have had a stand that yeah, it had some switchgrass in it, but it also had a very 
high percentage of weeds in it that could potentially outcompete. And, and if you're waiting for a lot of those seeds that are dormant and hard to germinate in the future, now you're just running into a problem where you have it full of weeds and right. why is anything going to germinate? You have weed cover in there along with switch cover and, and you want pure switch grass. Well, and that's just it. I mean, you're looking at planting something that really isn't going to hit your goal until the following growing season, end of that following growing season, where right. then it's gonna be that stand of screening that's gonna actually block you from deer and deer from you. So going into that second year with something that is already needing maintenance again. Full of weeds. Right, yeah. again, do it and right we, the first And we time. encourage that second spring to put simazine down mm -hmm. or atrazine before spring green up. That's kind of a fail safe. That's looking at it like, okay, we already have a 90% stand because we did it right to begin with, with chemicals. We're adding that and when you find that when you do it right with chemicals to begin with you're at about 90 95 percent growth the end of year two as as opposed to fighting the weeds at year three you might get that height but it's going to have a high percentage of weeds and you're not going to go very far and so this switchgrass stuff i hope you guys have stuck around because um the switchgrass is one thing not all of you are going to plant switchgrass but um where we talk about john we talk about bad seed mixes all the time and, and john and i we talked John, was it 10, 11 years ago um, when you yeah. when you first started your seed company? You've been around a long time. Yeah. And it's crazy that it went by that fast because I can picture a buck that I shot in 2013, 2012. Mm -hmm. And I was on that uh, the uh, WHS mix where we had the oats and peas, late planted beans. We started that all the way back there, yeah. It, well, we were testing it, I think. I think it's when yep. we were testing it back then. And yep. so um, it is pretty crazy when you think about it, it's been that long. But yep. part of that conversation was making sure we eliminated junk, making sure you provided a quality product. And that's what you wanted anyways. And so yep. um, it was really cool to be on the, the ground floor of that foundation of your seed and, and your ethics um, and, and how that's transferred today in your success. In, in this mix right here, I think, John, we could probably say this mix times 100 out there. Um, and if you want to go through, I, you know, I'm looking at, I'll just go through, uh, this is a four pound seed mix. And we have, there's ryegrass in there, which is junk. There's Dorf Essex rape, which when it's your only uh, form of brassica, then uh, that's, that's a bad seed. It's not, it's okay to have a little percentage in there, but um, you know, that's less than a dollar a pound, um, or, you know, it's it less than a dollar an acre if you look at it that way. Um, and then there's triticale in here, there's oats, um, which you don't blend with brassica, so that's a bad combination right there. So we can go through and kind of rip apart this combination, and it really isn't. It's meant for someone to put on the ground, and there's a lot of green, and they say, hey, I'm, I planted a great food plot. But John, I want you to start out with the biggest percentage in there. I'm looking at 60% and why that number is horrible <laughs> and what people really well, need to be wary of. What, what is that 60% there? What does it mean? And why do you not have that in your mix? Well, mix is. Six, mix is. 60% six, inert matter, which includes 6.12% coating material. Okay, so, so uh, I'm assuming the clover has yes. got an inoculant on it. Which is acceptable. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's, so we'll give them the benefit of the doubt, let's say so the coating material is you know, 10%. You still have 50% of this bag, two pounds, is inert matter. Well, what is it? I think it's when they what? scoop it off the floor with a butt, you know, with a shovel like, and they put I, it into their buckets. That's what, yeah. uh, and this is, let's say, we're not saying the, the seed company of this and we're, we're never gonna do that, but this is no. uh, a huge name that everyone would recognize. Well, you know, we're not trying to, disparage a company, but you're trying to be factual in a way, this, but we're, we're not making this, this is factual, this is an honest to goodness seed take sitting on somebody's lap right now, okay, half the bag, over half this bag is inert matter, so what you're dropping, funny. let's say a $20 bill, you might as well rip that $20 bill in half and just burn 10 bucks, okay, now, now let's talk about the other 50%, okay, 10% is ryegrass, well, I think you, everybody pretty much knows Jeff's stance, my stance, Dylan's stance on ryegrass. And honestly, yeah. I've, I've never <laughs> seen a habitat manager's plan where it says plant ryegrass. I've never seen that, nor will I ever. I got ryegrass in my yard. That's that's what it's good for. Throw this out there. 
the rain's going to do the rest. Okay, well, you've got oats. I'm not a big fan of putting oats on top of the ground unless you're going to crush buckwheat on top of it. Same thing with the peas. Oh, you're and not going to get those peas to grow. No, they're, they're just going to laugh at you. Unless you get a soaking rain for two weeks, well, then by that time, the food plot's underwater more than likely. So you could probably take of the two pounds of seed in there, maybe a pound of seed's going to amount to something. Amount to something that the whitetails can actually benefit from. Because, yeah. I mean, that's that's just so, it. The ryegrass portion, just for you guys that are following on going, why don't they like ryegrass, is deer don't want to eat it, and it's not doing anything for you other than making you pat yourself on the back going, wow, this looks green. And, and it's a perennial, yeah. and it sticks around forever, and it's hard to get rid of. You have to yep. kill it and spray it and, and get rid I, of it. I've got a video I did on our, on our Facebook page three years ago, and all around, Jeff, you've seen our pond, all around our pond when we dug it, we put perennial ryegrass in because it grows fast. Now, it right holds the soil. The pond, right behind that pond is our three, is our half acre food plot, okay? And the deer have to walk out of the bedding area through my ryegrass yard into the food plot. I can probably count in the last eight years on one hand, the amount of times I've seen a deer stop and take a bite of that ryegrass. <laughs> and it was probably a random mushroom growing up that <laughs> yeah. they liked. <laughs> but, but the, the point thing is this, is I sell food plot seed for a living. If ryegrass was such a great, phenomenal food plot draw, I would be insane not to be selling it. Yeah, amen. That's that's what a lot of this stuff. It's kind of like we're not, you know. In in John, you're like your switchgrass. You're selling Cave and Rock switchgrass. It's not some yeah. secret society nope. blend that you offer. It's nope. you're telling people what you're selling, and at the same time, it's because it's the best fit for most of the north half of the country, yeah. and uh, except for the stream extreme northern edge. But um, and, we've got some guys in northern Alabama giving it a shot this year. They're kind of getting picks for us down there. Oh. You know, and, I, and I said, we need moisture requirements, leaf control requirements, and, and as long as you're not planted in red clay, I think you're going to be just fine because we've planted yeah. it horrendous soils up here and it's done great. Well, and what's, what you notice in a lot of those areas, uh, it's not a northern variety, say for the Dakotas variety or a variety that you'd use north of Twin Cities, but when you do plant it in there, it grows. And a lot of those varieties, whether it's in the south or in the extreme north, are short varieties. And when you plant cave and rock, let's say it had a potential of seven foot or eight foot high somewhere else. Well, it might be four foot high, but that actually is about the same as some of those other varieties. And cave and rock is about the most cheap, the cheapest form of switchgrass and most available. So a lot of times it's actually uh, more appropriate for someone to plant cave and rock than it is a more regional uh, seed, uh, uh -huh. just because the height is going to be about the same and then availability and cost is is good now one of the things that um i want to point out too with you know you don't want to mix grains cereal grains uh triticale and um and uh oats with brassica the two compete each other the brassica yeah. you want to plant about a month to five weeks before the grains um generally they do compete each other um in fact they can really really stunt the brassica yeah and, and we've taken it where in you know been doing this and experimenting for so long but in 2004 we planted three pounds of brassica of a brassica blend per acre with the thought that we'd come back five weeks later at 200 pounds of winter rye to it and we thought well this would be the perfect mix and we did that the the brassica five weeks later four weeks later was only six inches high there was a lot of soil we came back and not in no rye, gra rye, perennial rye, fall rye, winter rye had actually grown because the brassica grew enough in those first few weeks after we put the rye down that it uh, shaded out the rye and killed it. And so, you know, you either way, if it's going to be good enough and early enough for the brassica, then it can outcompete and shade the, the, the cereal grain, even if you plant it at the appropriate time, meaning the cereal grain five, six weeks later. And if you go the other route, um, then it can stunt the brassica, and then it becomes too stemmy and dormant, and the deer don't like it. Um, another thing I'm looking at in the seed blend is oats, a stand or peas. A standalone pea planting is approximately 300 pounds per acre. That's an ag production. So when you have uh, five pounds of peas in a mix um, in a 50 pound bag, you're talking one pea plant every 30 feet. It's cool because you can say we have peas in the blend. But that's about it. So there's there's a lot of things. Just uh, chicory. Chicory sounds good on paper, 
but in using it in many different states and clients, um, it's generally the last thing they eat. And uh, it is actually a good nurse crop to clover during drought, and that's what I do like it for in sandy locations. I used it in the UP of Michigan like that. But, um, but really, I'm looking at, you know, we could, we could talk about all these different seed varieties out here and how it's a bad combination. And, um, but really, what it boils down to, when you're talking 60% inert matter, um, John, your, your blends, uh, let's say the WHS blend where we have the peas, oats, beans, mm -hmm. your sweet peas, brassica blend, um, how much inert matter is in those, those labels? Um, looking at the WHS tank right now, it's 0.5 grams of inert matter. Point, so less, a third of 1%. Is that what yeah, you just so said? What, yeah. What that is is that that's because of the oats in there. Yes. The and the, from the oats. we call that uh, M and M coating. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you'll you'll have that with with cereal grain, okay? Uh, because you then like I look at my rye, it's one percent, and that's just right. Oh, you yeah. know, when you get a heavy cereal grain, you'll get some of that. I, I think I honestly think sometimes there's a little dust in the bag too. I mean, it's just it's yeah. it, it could be applied to everything, but it. You right. know, and even your clover, your clover inert matter is higher because some of those seeds you can't get unless they're coated. And some of the yeah. clover you can get yeah. uncoated and they don't need to be coated. And then some you can't even buy and add to your mix unless they're coated. So right. um, that right. percentage goes up a little bit. But even your clover that actually requires coating in your clover mix, what uh, percentage is inert matter? Well, not even say inert matter, what percentage is uh, coating? Uh the inert matter on our clover blend is 11.58, and that's one of the four varieties of clover is coated. And the only reason it's coated because it's such a good, it's been our go-to clover from day one. Yeah. And, and we've been transitioning to uncoated seed that we just have inoculated before it goes in the bag. But I couldn't get this clover anymore unless we stayed with the, the coated. And okay. I, it, it's such a good, it does such a wonderful job. I'm like, okay, we'll yeah. keep it cold. But it's not like I've seen clover blends, 60% of it. So you're buying a four pound bag, you're only getting two pounds of clover. Jeez. Yeah. Uh, because of all the coating. But then now uh, the inert matter in our, our sweet beast is 0.55, so less than half a percent. Wow. Uh, or, a, or a half a wow. percent inert matter. Well, you know, in, in, in looking back, we have the inert matter, but even looking back in some of these, you know, ryegrass is junk. We talk about that all the time. Um, again, the peas, their uh, standalone pea planting is 300 pounds per acre. Mm -hmm. So when you have such a small percentage, it's more or less you can just put it on the bag. And a lot of this stuff is on the bag so that they can actually say that's in the bag. And it right. looks like a cool blend. Yep. And you throw it out. And so, yeah. John, we'll, we'll wrap this up. But we, yep. we greatly appreciate your integrity because Dylan and I, like I said, we wouldn't change your recommendations just because uh, we're not looking people in the face. We're actually looking at the camera right now and we're making recommendations. Um, but when we have clients right in front of us, and especially Dylan when he's flying into clients, and I've done, flown into a lot of clients in the past where you're spending uh, three days with them. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and you get to know them. We had a comment from our Oklahoma. Dylan went to Oklahoma, Oklahoma last week. Yep. They said that they could see why we refer to Dylan as our fourth child or our <laughs> oldest child. <laughs> so it's uh, um, they really love spending the time with Dylan. And when you get to know these people, um, we appreciate any product we recommend. It's because we would use it, right. and we can honestly tell people we think this is the best for you to use. Yep. We're just trying to help you out. So we appreciate that integrity and uh, and so much, John, because it does help us uh, and make these recommendations. And again, we're not saying that no one else has integrity in the seed business. It's just right. we know for a fact you do, and uh, and we can we've had that long history. Uh, you know, Dylan, uh, we we've talked a lot, you and John, John and I, and mm -hmm. and so um, Dylan, you know, we'll leave you with something. Um, and I know that you've had great conversations about seed with clients. Right. Yeah, and, and that's that's something that you know I'll just mention because I've only been to you know a handful of clients compared to what Jeff has been to but so many people trust Jeff's word have taken his recommendation gone with Northwoods whitetail seeds and still want to use it have nothing but good things to say about it that it's just extremely impressive to not only see how how many people trust us but also continue to trust you and your company and you know I think yeah. we missed that comment before about you know what your 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 tagline is about your company is 
not the biggest, but the best. Is that, did I say that right? Yeah, we started using that on Instagram and I, you know, and we were talking before, I'm, I've got absolutely no desire to be the biggest seed company out there, yep. none whatsoever. Mm-hmm. Okay. No. But, I just want to yeah. be one of the best and I think we're right. well on our way. And, and again, you need to have that hashtag, look what's in the bag, because you actually have clear bags. <laughs> yep. And, and yep. hey, we'll leave something else with you, John. I have a question for you. Sure. And I think it's a burning question that thousands of people would want to know. Uh, <laughs> when, when are you offering birdseed? <laughs> when are you going to offer birdseed? I think it'd be a great complimentary product to what you do. I, I was looking the other day, I want to buy some birdseed, and I thought, I have to actually go off John's page and find birdseed somewhere else. <laughs> you got to have that right there. It's like you know, it's like those candy bars I can't pass as a diabetic at the checkout. Right. Line. <laughs> so that's you know we're always looking. Um, we've got a couple of ideas for some for some uh, other other business lines. Once we well you you've been to our shop, Jeff, and you know we're just we're just flat out of room up here. I know we're, it's yeah, it's pretty crazy. Building. Yeah, for <laughs> folks, I mean you wouldn't know. Building. It, yeah. Well, if you go follow you on Instagram, there was a recent over the weekend of all the boxes you were shipping yeah. out uh, yeah. today <laughs> and in every day. And a lot of people don't realize, you know, it's you, your wife, staff, Nate yeah. helps sometimes. I don't know if yeah. Carly helps, but this, uh, I think your brother helps sometimes. No, we, we actually hired, we have an employee we hired. Okay. And yeah, but, but anyway, that once we get some room, we're looking at doing, because your, your seat sales then pretty much, gosh, October, you know, and then it really starts to pick up again January 1st. Right. And you're looking maybe to fill that void for three months or something. But yeah, birdseed, you, we talked about that once before, about some, <laughs> some Northwoods birdseed line or something. So we'll see. If you, if you don't do it, I'm going to put it on my site, John. So it's got kind of a, <laughs> I think it's so well. But anyways. Yeah, um, you're, you're not busy enough, so yeah, you need one more. <laughs> Yeah, no, we we definitely have to find a drop ship, ship yeah. source for that, too. Uh, Diane's already uh, sending out several thousand packages a year of books and uh, coordinating that. So, uh, John, again, thank you so much for being um, on our show today. And uh, we'll definitely have you again in the future. We um, really appreciate you. And let's uh, let's say goodbye this time, but um, we'll definitely have you again soon. And, uh, we again, we really appreciate you. Absolutely. Right, thank you so guys. much. Yeah, thank you. Now, as we transition into habitat season, I hope you've had a chance to check out my web class, How to Design Your Web your Whitetail Parcel. It's on my website, whitetailhabitatsolutions.com. I have a link in the description, and I hope you can find it, check it out, and enjoy it this year.